right. Good evening to those of us, those of you joining us from the Western Hemisphere. And good morning and good afternoon to those of you in the Eastern Hemisphere. And welcome to this, the third in a series of eight webinars that the XX Network team is going to be sharing uh, over the course of the next few weeks. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are joining us live, notice that at the bottom of your webinar screen, you've got both a Q&A box as well as a chat box. Feel free to communicate with us during the webinar. We're going to aim to have a dedicated Q&A section towards the end. And so we're going to be steering most questions to there, but feel free to be asking questions throughout. Um, as with our past webinars, the rules are, of the road here are very simple. First, we welcome a lively exchange of views, but ask that everyone remain respectful of one another. Uh, second of all, this is a webinar focused on the details of our technology. Uh, it's not a forum where we can discuss any kind of coin sale of the XX coin. And so nothing in this conversation should be taken as investment advice or a solicitation to buy any kind of financial product. Um, so that's it for the rules. Otherwise, we're really excited to have so many folks join us. And again, it's exciting for us to be able to really share with you, the community, uh, the technology, the ideas that we've been working on uh, for months and in some cases for many years. And so with that, let's jump to the next slide here and introduce the members of the XX Network team who will be joining us here this evening. Uh, first, we have Will Carter who's the Chief Operating Officer of Praxis. Will has a background at NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, second, we have Ben, who is our VP of Architecture at Elixir. Uh, he's got a background in electrical engineering and, uh, and augmented reality, uh, and has really helped to lead the Elixir's uh, engineering team. We also have uh, Bernie Cardozo, who's a senior software engineer at Praxis, uh, has helped to kind of design are thinking about decentralized networks. We also have Mario Costa, who's a cryptographer. He's published some works in cryptography and done research with David Chom, our founder. And then also we have Jake Taylor joining us this evening from the Elixir team. Jake is a system and infrastructure engineer, uh, did a lot of great work to bring the AlphaNet uh, up to a state of, of deployment. And finally, we have myself, Peter Somerville. I'm the head of Node and Developer Relations uh, with the Praxis team. And so that means that if you're part of the node operator community or the developer DAP community, I'd be delighted to get in touch with you, share where we are uh, in building out those communities. So for an overview of what we're gonna cover this evening, uh, four main topics, and we're gonna kind of pick up where we left off with the first couple of webinars. Both of those have been published to the Praxis YouTube page. And so you can catch those if you didn't, weren't able to tune in last week for those. We're gonna get more uh, into the details of the technology this evening. And so that means the XX coin, getting into the details of how it works, the XX consensus, how do we achieve speed, scalability, and security, XX communication, how did this, this messaging network really work in a truly untraceable private way and then bring all those threads together for the XX network. And that's kind of exemplified with the image here on this next slide. Um, and you can see, again, the kind of central role that nodes play in all of these actions of the XX network. And so kind of reading from the top left on downwards, you've got the mixing team that are executing the CMEX protocol. That's Elixir technology, where they process that batch of messages in a way that shreds metadata, shreds metadata and then transactions are then brought to a block producer, which is one of the nodes who produces that, that batch of, of transactions, which are then verified by an endorser set. Uh, and finally, once you have that set of transactions confirmed, they create the next block in the blockchain. And so this is uh, a visual overview of the topics that we're gonna be covering this evening. Um, and so at this point, Let's dive in and start talking about the XX coin. Okay, so let's look at the XX coin, the quantum secure denominated currency that runs on the XX network. Look at potential coin structures that we have going on. The quantum secure signatures, how they work. I'm actually going to give an example of 
how quantum secure signatures work and explain the one we use concretely. Then look at the, uh, an example transaction of a denominated coin. So we identified three potential coin structures for our platform. The first one is denominated coins. This is very similar to the actual physical cash we find out there. So, but instead of using like normal denominations that for example, the US dollar has, we use base two numbers. So in our platform, you would find one, two, four, eight, 16, or even fractions. These are the pedigree of privacy. These take full advantage of the Elixir privacy and these are the ones you wanna use if that's your main concern. We also have wallets. Wallets are the most common like out there. When you are on the, on the blockchain space, these are the ones you find. These are just multi-use address that you can use to send and receive XX coins. We had to tweak this a bit because we want this to be a multi-use and we use one-time signatures. So we built this by linking a list of hash-based public keys to each wallet address. These have slightly less privacy. These are more like focused for a different use case. Then we have multi-signatures, which can be either denominated or wallet-based. These are designed mostly to fill a gap in the use case space that we have. So mostly for escrow, joint custody, or smart contracts. So why a quantum secure currency? So quantum computers are closing in and they can actually break many cryptographic primitives. So basically a lot of public key cryptography that we use right now relies on the discrete logarithm problem and the discrete logarithm problem in elliptic curves and the factorization of large primes. Both these problems belong, are, part of, are, a subgroup, are part of the subgroup problem, and these can be broken by quantum computers. So we wanted to play it super safe, and we want, we're thinking long-term, so we had to have a quantum secure currency. So how do we solve this? We use a one-time use hash-based signature. So we basically just changed the watts plus to suit our needs properly. Let's start with what a hash function is. So a hash function is no more than a one-way function that converts any input string of any length and produces a deterministic fixed size output. So if I hash Mario today in one minute or tomorrow, the output will always be the same. What are the security requirements for this? First, we would like it to be pre-image resistant. So basically, if I give you a hash output, you should not be able to find the corresponding input. So you should not be able to invert it. Then we would like it to be second pre-image resistant. So if I give you an input, in this case, Mario, and the hash of Mario, you should not be able to find a different string, string or anything that maps to a collision. So you should not be able to find it. And then lastly, we have collision resistance. This is basically very similar to the previous definition, except the adversary has full control. Adversary can choose any type of input and just is trying, gonna try to find a collision. <clears throat> For our platform, the main requirement that we need for the hash function is for it to be second pre-image resistant. So what are hash-based signatures? So we, I'm just gonna like give a couple of examples where you can find out there, the lamp or signatures, winter nits, one-time signatures, the same but plus, winter nits, one-time signatures plus, extended Merkle signature scheme, Sphinx, there are many out there and many have different like uses. Why are they quantum resistant? For basically to attack our hash-based signature schemes, the attacker must find a second pre-image, that notion that I just introduced in the previous slide. This takes roughly two to the 90 work for a quantum computer. So just to give an example, the Bitcoin network right now produces roughly two to the 80 uh, computing power per year. So we could convert literally the entire Bitcoin mining to quantum computing, and it would still take them thousands of years to break one of our wallets. That's how serious we take this, our security. So to actually give more context to this, I wanna explain how hash-based signatures work. So I'm actually gonna explain Lamport signatures because I believe they're the easier to understand. So how does key generation work? Let's assume that we wanna sign an eight-bit message in this example. So for that, we need to generate the secret key. 16 secret values, so just two times the number of bits in the message. So in this case, you can see in purple, eight bits here and eight secret keys here and eight secret keys here. Then what is the public key? No more than just the hash of each of these values. So as represented here on the right side. How do we actually sign? Super simple. We go through every bit that we want to sign and release the corresponding secret key, depending on whether it's a zero or a one. So for example, here, the first bit of the message we wanna sign, it's a zero. Therefore, it has to come from the purple set. The second and third bit, for example, are from our ones, so they need to come from the second, the blue set. 
Once you go through every single bit, you're done. You have signed the message. Verifying, super simple. You just go through the signature and you see you hash that secret key that was released. If it's part of the set, then it's valid. If not, then it's a, an invalid signature. I just want to point out that basically the main difference between a Lamport signature and the Winternet's one-time signature is that instead of signing individual bits in the Winternet scheme, you actually sign bytes. So we actually end up with a smaller signature. This will be very useful in our platform, as you will see. Lastly, I want to show what a denominated coin transaction looks like. So here we're assuming Alice, address A, wants to move money to address B. So Alice just has to sign a transaction. And what does a transaction look like? It's no more than signing Bob's address. So Alice is going to sign Bob's address on the right and send that to the platform. Platform is going to receive that transaction, check if the signature is valid, if it has enough money, and if it passes all those tests, it's just going to update the tree and change at Alice's address to Bob's address. That's it. Now I'm going to hand it over to William Carter. All right, thanks, Mario. So in this portion of the webinar, we're going to talk about the XX consensus, which is the first and only consensus protocol with the speed, scalability, and security to really support the mainstream adoption of blockchain technology. So first, I'm going to quickly go over the requirements that we identified in the last webinar as being critical to this mainstream adoption. And then I'm going to outline the approaches that we used to kind of meet these requirements. Um, and once we've set some of this context down, Bernie, Mario, and myself will break down these five approaches kind of at a knee deep level and walk you through a simplified consensus round. All right, so these are the requirements we laid out in the last webinar. And I think it's important to go through and refresh on why these are important and how they stack up with the three properties I mentioned on the previous slide. So the first of these properties is speed. If we're gonna replace the centralized infrastructure we currently use, the platform cannot feel significantly slower than the technology we've grown accustomed to. User experience is key to gaining mainstream consumer adoption and part of that UX is quick responsive apps and payments. So in order to meet this, we need a consensus to reach finality in seconds and support many thousands of transactions a second. Next is scalability. So you'll hear a lot about this uh, when it comes to consensus, and that's because it is critical to the ethos of decentralization. An important aspect of decentralization is having the opportunity as a user to own and operate a node in the network. And having a large number of widely distributed nodes is important not only to keeping the network decentralized, but also for keeping the network robust, which is in our last property, security. And when we talk about robustness, we're referring to the network's ability to continue operating securely in the face of disruption. That disruption could be from malicious nodes, it could be from malicious users, an unreliable network, or even a nation state adversary. Uh, robustness combined with quantum security really ensures that the wealth and data that users push through the platform remains safe well into the future. Now, Mario touched on quantum security, and it's important to note that post-quantum crypto is generally pretty unwieldy. He was mentioning the size of these uh, signatures. And because these signatures are generally much larger than the ones currently used in public key infrastructure, uh, and that they can only be used once, uh, because of this, you can't easily retrofit existing platforms to be quantum secure without introducing some major performance issues. So consensus should really be designed with quantum security in mind if that's a property you value. And that's exactly what we've done here. So these are our requirements. And now we're gonna look at the approaches uh, we've developed and used to achieve them. So these are those five approaches. Um, I'm gonna touch on each one of them briefly because we're actually gonna dig down into all of them in more detail later on. The first is NodeCon. This is a way to securely initialize the network and also to seed randomness, which we use throughout consensus um, and which is our next approach, committed randomness. And that is a way to generate global randomness every block. And we do that by chaining off of the NodeCon random. Third is a concept called compact endorsement, um, which is a way for us to prove finality to clients in a compact uh, but quantum secure manner. Again, important uh, because we just kind of portrayed how big these quantum secure signatures are. And then fourth and most importantly to our performance, uh, 
is endorser sampling. And this uses committed randomness to select a random set of nodes to take on the resource intensive process of receiving and verifying transactions. And finally, we have efficient fallbacks. Um, this is a way for us to quickly recover from disruptions that occurred during consensus. So generally in a decentralized network, initialization, initialization means signing and publishing a Genesis block with the initial minted coins in the network. Now we sat down and spent a lot of time thinking about what this network initialization should look like and how you should kickstart the network in the most secure way possible. And so NodeCon is one way we propose to do this. Uh, we envision it as one or more physical events where users and nodes can attend, they can learn how to run a node, they can participate in governance, uh, learn how to develop on the platform. And then more importantly, because we have all the nodes uh, or at least an initial set of nodes in attendance, uh, they can establish some secure primitives that will be used throughout the lifetime of the network uh, in a secure and trustless manner. And so we're gonna look at what those primitives are. And the first uh, is actually very critical to consensus and that's generating a secure random seed. And we call this the NodeCon random. This seed is used throughout consensus. We'll go into how later, um, but first we want to talk about how it's generated. And in order to understand this, we need to understand a very simple approach called hash commits, uh, which builds off of hash functions, which Mario uh, explained earlier. And hash commits are used extensively throughout our protocol and at NodeCon. And so what is a hash commit? Uh, a hash commit is basically a way for a node to publicly publicly commit to a secret value uh, without revealing the, the secret itself. So a node can generate a lot of secret values, it can hash them, and then it can share those outputs with the rest of the world. Um, and they'll never be able to reverse engineer them and find out what those secret values are until the node is ready to share them. So when that node is called upon to reveal one of those secrets, the public can verify that it hasn't been modified because they can hash that secret and check the output against the public commit that was shared. Uh, this concept makes use of two of the properties of hash functions that Mario mentioned. Uh, the first is that they're not reversible. This was uh, pre-image resistance and second pre-image resistance, um, which basically means given this public commit, I distribute these public commits out to the network. Nobody's able to reverse engineer it and find out what that secret value is ahead of time. And second, they're deterministic. So if the secret value has not been modified, it will always result in the same public commit when someone goes to hash it and verify it. So again, using these two properties, we can have nodes commit to secret values that they will reveal at a later date, but that are unmanipulatable because anyone can verify that they match the public commits. Now, obviously each node is gonna have to generate a lot of these commits. So we're gonna need an efficient way to publish these to the rest of the network without having to share each individual commit. To do this, we use a structure called a Merkle tree, which you see to the right. This is obviously a small tree, um, but you know, for example, but can be expanded to hold as many commits as needed. And the magic of it is that you only need to share the root of the tree in order to commit to all the leaves below it. So let's take a look at how this works. Each node in the tree is the hash of the two children nodes. Um, and so if we, if we look at this image, the, the node here is the hash of the two public commits below it, uh, similarly over here, and then the root is the hash of the two nodes below it as well. And since a node only shares the root of this tree, we need to find a way to prove that any commit that it reveals were actually committed by that root. Uh, without having to share that whole tree. And in order to do this, we use a concept called a Merkle proof. And it's basically a clever way to prove that a node is in a tree without seeing the whole tree. And to do this, we use the hash properties of the tree. And so say I wanna reveal this first secret value, uh, the nodes all have this root. All I need to do is send the secret value, this public commit, and this node here. And by hashing the secret value, they're able to get this public commit, hashing it with the public commit we gave them results in this node. And because they have this node, they can hash them together. And if it matches the commit root that they were given, then they know that that secret value was actually committed to in that, in that root. 
So all the nodes in the network will commit to a tree like this before NodeCon. And uh, you'll notice we have a specific tree uh, for NodeCon secrets and their roots over here to the left. And if you remember, the first thing we're actually trying to do here at NodeCon before I explained all this is generate a secure random value. And in order to make this unmanipulatable by any party, we want every node who attends to be involved in generating it. So we do this by having every node submit one of the secret values in their NodeCon tree. We publicly combine these values into a single random value using something like a hash function or an XOR. And because these values were committed to beforehand, anyone is able to verify that they haven't been manipulated to influence the random. And uh, this is unique because even if every single node in the network uh, is, is working together to influence this random, it only takes one honest node uh, to make the results of the random unpredictable. And so at the end of this, we end up with a very secure random value. Once we have that random value, we're going to create what's called uh, quantum secure authenticated channels between every node that in attendance. These allow nodes to communicate with each other during consensus while ensuring that messages came from the expected sender and have not been manipulated. So we're actually gonna do this in a very similar way as we generated the NodeCon random. Each node is gonna meet with every other node and they're gonna exchange a secret but committed value. When the nodes go home, they XOR or hash these values together and the result will be a quantum secure symmetric key that only they know and that didn't rely on any you know, trusted or centralized infrastructure like a key server to generate. The third thing we wanna do, and while it looks like a joke, it's actually pretty important, is, is to really just kind of meet everyone else in the network in person, all the other nodes. Um, and this is a powerful way to mitigate the Sybils in an early network. And you know, in the process of exchanging these keys with uh, the other nodes in the network, uh, you kind of get to ask them what their motivations are, uh, look them in the eye, and you become relatively confident that the other nodes are, they're, they're actually real people and they're not a bunch of machines spinned up by a single party. So this is something we think is important um, and is one of the reasons why we went for a physical event. And so once we have all these things, we're ready to sign the Genesis block. Um, and this is what's gonna contain the trees of initial minted coins, the initial list of nodes in the network and the NodeCon random we generated. And then obviously once this is done, NodeCon is finished, we can all get drinks and hors d'oeuvres. And uh, once we have that NodeCon random, this is really important, uh, and the membership list signed into the Genesis block, then we can actually start consensus. And we've actually seeded our next approach, which we will call committed randomness. So we, we, we've actually already talked a little bit about what committed randomness is. Uh, so now I'm going to kind of explain how it's used in consensus to randomly select nodes uh, for certain tasks. So you'll recognize this image from NodeCon. Uh, all nodes have committed to this placard. And we use this NodeCon tree to do some fancy stuff at NodeCon. Uh, but right now we're, we're going to look at the randoms root, or the, the randoms tree actually. And before I do, I need to mention the three entities in the network. Um, because they'll be used throughout the rest of this prompt, uh, presentation, it's important to know what they are and what they do. So the block producer is the leader of each round. They're gonna be responsible for proposing the block, revealing a secret value from that random tree. And uh, we'll go into that in just a moment. The endorsers are randomly selected nodes uh, and their job is to verify the signatures and the transactions that the BP proposes. And as you might guess, the random selection of these nodes uses the committed randomness approach that I'm about to describe. Uh, and finally, the network is the collection of all the nodes in the network. So this includes the BP and the endorsers for the round. And they're gonna kind of confirm the endorsement was successful. So once the endorsers have verified all the transactions in a block, uh, the network will confirm that that endorsement was successful. Now it's important to note that every node in our network has an equal opportunity to be the BP or an endorser. Uh, and this really ties back to the egalitarian nature of our consensus, which we mentioned in the last webinar. And because of this, we don't suffer from centralization, you know, due to concentration of power, uh, computing power, or, or even wealth. And um, I, one last thing I want to mention on this slide is, you'll remember Mario talked about one-time use hash-based signatures. 
and that the particular protocol we use is a tailored version of what's plus. And so because they're one time use, we need to commit to a lot of public keys for use in consensus. And that's what this little tree on the right is for. Um, this is just a compact way for us to commit to all the, the what's plus public keys that we're going to use throughout consensus. All right, so let's dig into this random tree. Uh, you'll notice this is organized in a slightly different way uh, than the node con tree. The leaves of the node con tree were commitments to secret values, and here the leaves of the tree are um, the rungs or the, the top rungs of, of ladders of secret values. And each rung in this ladder is the hash of the rung below it. So, you know, if, if round one is the hash of round two, and round two is a hash of round three, and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, there's gonna be many more than 12 rounds. We're just showing this for simplicity. And this is really just a way for us to compress commitments in, a, in an additional way. Um, but what's really important here is that each node has a commitment for every round or block. And if that node is chosen as the BP for that round, then they're required to reveal the committed random in their ladder that responds to the round. So if a, no, if, if a node is selected to be the BP for round five, they need to reveal the committed random for round five. And we, we call this reveal the BP reveal. And then obviously anyone who wants to verify that that is a valid reveal would just hash round five, they would get round four, they would hash round four, they would get the latter two, and generally they would probably have all the leaves of this tree and they could verify uh, that it equals the random's root. So just to recap, um, a BP is expected to reveal a secret random value uh, every round and that they have committed to. We call that the BP reveal. And so this diagram is how we apply that BP reveal every round to generate unmanipulatable and unminable randomness. Uh, you'll notice this is very similar in structure to a blockchain. So we'll call it a randomness chain moving forward. And the random that we generate in every block uh, is used to select two things. The first is a BP for each round, um, but also a set of endorsers for each round. Uh, we're only gonna show the cases here where the BP is not malicious and actually does reveal their random. And later on, we'll ex examine what happens if the uh, BP does not reveal the random. So you'll notice this chain starts with the node con seed. This is actually imperative to the validity of the chain. So if an adversary could manipulate the random seed and mine the random uh, reveals so that say they uh, only selected malicious nodes that they were working with uh, going into the future, then the security of the network would be at risk. So this is actually why we spent so much energy generating a secure random at NodeCon. Um, going back to it, this seed here will select the first BP. And this BP will propose the first block and in the process of doing so, reveal a random to the network, this BP reveal. Now by hashing that reveal with the node con seed, this H is for hash, uh, we get two things. We obviously get the, the random for the next round, uh, but we also get a set of nodes to act as the endorsers. The random for the next round uh, is likewise used to select the next BP. And when the BP reveals uh, his random, it's hashed together with the block one random and selects the block two random and the endorsers for that block and so on and so forth. And so this is pretty much how BP selection and endorser selection uh, work in our network. And from here, Mario is going to go ahead and explain how compact endorsements work uh, before we look at the consensus loop itself. All right, let's look at how this works. So first, Hash based signatures, like the one we use, Winterness one time signature, they have a couple of drawbacks. They are very large, especially if we compare them to standard elliptic curve signatures. And there's not really a signature aggregation scheme. So, for example, on elliptic curves, you can perform some operations with, like, between like multiple signers and make sure that one final signature that belongs to multiple people actually maps to one curve. Thus, the, sign, the size remains constant. However, with hashes, that's not possible. If you want to accumulate multiple hashes, multiple hash signatures from multiple people, they usually grow, in, they, they grow too quickly. So this is like not ideal, especially because we want our platform 
to support mobile clients, people that just have a data connection that they want to make sure that something happened and like it's final. And we don't really want to consume all of the, their data plan. So to solve this, we are introducing a novel quantum secure hash based group endorsement scheme. Where basically the endorsers are signing a hash of the block just tied to one of their own secrets. Now there's a very interesting fact here in this scheme. Each endorsement on its own, it's not secure. However, if we group them in a multi-party computation style, they actually constitute a valid proof of finality. I'm actually going to go over this structure now. So as you saw before in the Lamport signature scheme, we actually generated 16 secrets. Here, we're talking only four. We generate four secret keys. That's it. Then we go down the ladder. We hash each of these secrets roughly to 255 times. We combine all of this into one public key. So a public key is just a hash of all of these top rungs of the ladder. Then to actually produce an endorsement, this is what we do. We get the block that we want to sign, this top rung of the ladder, and then we hash those two values and we actually sign it. This is a very, very compact signature. This is top of the line hash rate signature. So now I actually wanna dive into the consensus structures. And I wanna start with some context. First, I wanna go over the network assumptions then the adversarial model, and then some data structures and entities in our system. So regarding network assumptions, we, we envision a partial synchrony mo network model. So basically, there will, we assume that there will be moments in time where the network will not be in synchrony. And after some GST, global civilization time, the nodes will be able to be back in sync. So they will be able to catch up and make sure that they know what, what actually happened. Our Byzantine assumption is the traditionally found out there, n equals 3f plus 1. So what is that? So to tolerate f faulty nodes, we need a network size of three times the bad guys plus 1. We also assume that our network might be completely unreliable. So it might fail to deliver messages, actually delay them, duplicate them, or deliver messages out of order. Obviously, our nodes need to be prepared to handle any of these situations regarding the actual adversary. So the adversary controls every single malicious node in the network, it's one single entity. And it's able to actually instantly modify their state at any time. Moreover, it has the ability of viewing the state of every honest node. And it's able to break all crypto that relies on the hidden subgroup problem. This is just a fancy way to say that it can break the discrete logarithm problem and the factoring of large primes. So essentially it has access to a quantum computer. I'm now gonna hand it over to Bernie, who's gonna go over the data structures. Thank you, Mario. So during the operation of XX consensus, there are three data structures involved, which are the transactions, the state update, and the block. Like mentioned before by Mario, quantum secure hash-based signatures are quite large, which makes the list of transactions the absolute largest piece of data that needs to be shared in the network. Transactions are organized in the Merkle tree, which is a structure that we'll already explain in the node code section. Sending all the transactions to every node in the network would impact XX consensus performance. So to avoid this, we found a way to compress the transactions, so to speak. This is done by first decoding the address of the source of the money from the signature. Then the signature can be removed completely, which leaves us with just a list of source and destination addresses of tokens or wallets. We can then create another Merkle tree with this list, and we get what we call the state update. We gave it this name because it contains all the information needed by any node in order to update the state of the ledger. Finally, we have the block, which as you can see is extremely small. We actually tried to represent the data structures to scale in this slide, but we couldn't do it because in order for the block to be seen, the transactions will actually occupy the entire slide. The block only contains a new random value and the Merkle roots of the other two data structures. By including these roots, the state update and list of transactions for this round are immutably linked to the block. This allows consensus to reach agreement only on the block and produce a proof of finality for it. This is of extreme importance in the mobile world, as Mara has mentioned before, because clients only need to download a very lightweight blockchain in order to verify that their transactions have been completed. So they don't even need to see all of the transactions that have happened in each block or each round. So different entities in the XX network will exchange these data structures during consensus. 
Will has already described this, but we will touch again on it because it's very important for the operation of consensus. First, we have the block producer, which is the leader of each round and proposes the block to the network. Then we have the endorsers, a randomly chosen and fixed size set of nodes, which are responsible for validating the transactions included in the block proposal. The endorsers receive all the transactions from the BP. Finally, all the nodes in the system, including the BP and the endorsers, form the network. In a consensus round, all the nodes in the network just receive a block and a state update from the BP. Then, when the consensus produces a proof of finality, nodes can safely execute the state update and reach the latest state of the ledger. Again, I would like to stress the very important point that nodes in the network that are not endorsers never need to receive the very large transactions. Now that we have defined the data structures and entities participating in XX consensus, we can focus on our most important Cree approach, endorser sampling. Endorser sampling is a process of randomly selecting a constant size subset of nodes from the network to become endorsers for a round of consensus. Like mentioned before, endorsers are responsible for validating the transactions included in the proposed block. If all are valid, they endorse the block by signing its hash and sending this signature to the whole network. Endorser sampling is of paramount importance to the performance of XX consensus. As an example, we can think of selecting a sample of 100 endorsers out of a network of 1,000 nodes. The 100 endorsers need to validate the signatures on each transaction, which is a very computationally expensive operation. However, the remaining 900 nodes in the network are only passively participating in consensus, waiting for the block endorsement from these 100 endorsers. This frees up their computational resources to execute other tasks, which is very important for the XX network, as we will be explained later in this webinar. Using endorser sampling, XX consensus achieves linear scalability. This is a concept we will not focus on. Here we have an example of the three communication scalability complexities we usually see in consensus protocols, constant, linear, and quadratic. Constant means our fixed size set of nodes always communicates with another fixed amount of nodes, for example, one to two. In linear complexity, a set of nodes needs to communicate with all the nodes in the network, which in our example is one to three. Quadratic complexity means every node in the network needs to communicate with every other node. So for example, three to three. This means that there are three squared, which is nine communications. In this example, quadratic complexity doesn't appear to be a big issue, but this changes drastically when we increase the size of the network. Now we have the same diagrams for a network of seven nodes. It is easy to see that for constant and linear complexities, the number of communication between nodes remains bearable. The same two for constant, only seven for linear. However, in quadratic complexity, now we have seven squared, which is 49 communications. This is a much higher number. We aren't even sure if we drew all 49 connections in the diagram. This provides our motivation for having a constant or linear scalable consensus algorithm. Endorser sampling allows us to achieve linear authenticator complexity because only the constant size endorser set needs to communicate with every other node in the network. However, all these other nodes in the network only need to communicate with the endorser set in return, meaning that they actually achieve constant complexity. Endorser sampling also achieves another important property, which is constant communications complexity, because the BP only needs to send the very large transactions to the fixed size endorser set. When we measure performance of any consensus algorithm, the theory dictates that the worst case complexity always wins. This means that excess consensus is linear scalable. However, as we've seen, only the endorsers actually have linear complexity. Every other node in the network is constant. In practice, this means that the performance of XX consensus will actually be closer to constant than linear. Now that we have described four of our five key approaches, we are ready to dive into the actual intrinsics of the XX consensus algorithm. We will start by describing how XX consensus works under normal network conditions. We call this the optimistic path, and its operation is divided into four major phases, propose, validate, confirm, and commit. In the propose phase, the leader of consensus, the BP, will send its block proposal to the network. The BP proceeds in the following manner. First, it will validate all the transactions it has received from XX communications or directly from clients, discarding the invalid ones. Then it will build the state update and the block with the valid transactions. Finally, the BP sends this block and state update to the whole network and in parallel sends all the transactions just to the endorsers. 
Once the endorsers receive the transactions, they enter the next phase of consensus. This phase is the validate phase, where endorsers are actually validating the transactions and then endorsing the block proposal. They start by validating the signatures on each transaction, and then check the current state of the ledger and confirm that the source address contains enough funds to carry out the payment. If all transactions are valid, endorsers sign the block hash, send the signature, which is the endorsement, to the rest of the network. In order to have confidence that a block is valid, if in, nodes in the network can't trust a single endorser. Instead, they need to gather a quorum of endorsements, which is simply a minimum required percentage of uh, signatures from the endorser set, for example, 65%. This quorum percentage is a parameter of the consensus algorithm, and we tuned it so that the probability of failure in our system is in the order of once in many million years. Any node in the network that receives a quorum of endorsements is ready to start the next phase. In this phase, the confirm phase, nodes in the network send back signatures to the endorsers in order to let them know that they have seen the quorum of endorsements and are therefore ready to accept the block proposal. Basically, after seeing a quorum of endorsements, nodes create a confirmed signature on the block hash and send it to all the endorsers. Then, endorsers wait to receive a network majority of confirmed signatures from the network in order to maintain the safety of the consensus algorithm. To understand how this confirmed phase ensures safety, we need to briefly explain the concept of Byzantine fault tolerance, or BFT. Under the influence of Byzantine actors, it is of paramount importance that a majority of nodes in the network agree on the same block. This majority is two thirds plus one of the network, which has been proven to be the minimum necessary in order to achieve agreement under the BFT paradigm. To explain this two thirds plus one requirement, we can think of the following exercise. Small group of friends trying to decide whether to have burgers or pizza for lunch. Let's consider a group of four where two are Byzantine, which means they can lie about their preference. The other two friends are honest and have publicly revealed that one wants pizza and another wants burgers. Now the Byzantine friends can separately tell each honest one that they agreed their decision, leaving each of them to believe that they have reached a majority with three votes the honest friends go ahead and order their preferred food, later to find out that there was a split decision and they were misled by the Byzantine friends. This situation is what leads to forks in blockchain platforms, where different nodes follow different decisions. However, if we now analyze the situation with only one Byzantine actor, we can see that only one set of the group will be able to achieve three votes, while the other can only have two votes. This means that it will always be safe to follow the decision that has reached the three votes, since three is the two thirds plus one majority of a set of four. Going back to the confirmed phase, any endorser that gathers a quorum of confirmed signatures moves on to the next and final phase of consensus. The commit phase, where nodes in the network gather a quorum of commit endorsements and finalize a block. Endorsers use the quantum secure group endorsement scheme that was described by Mario to sign the hash of the block, certifying that the network should commit to it. Then, nodes in the network wait to receive another quorum of these commit endorsements, again, for example, 65%, and combine them into a proof of finality that can be provided to clients. Finally, nodes commit the block to the blockchain and execute the state update, reaching the latest state of the ledger. We have described how XX consensus works in a procedural way. And now we take a look at a timing diagram of a typical round of consensus. It can be seen that the BP waits for transactions and then starts decoding and sending them to the endorsers in parallel. Then it will build the block and state update. After, once the transactions have been received by the endorsers, the BP proposes the block to the network. At the same time, endorsers already started validating the transactions so that they can quickly send out their endorsements once every node in the network has seen the block proposal, since this proposal takes some time to propagate. Finally, the endorser, the endorsers confirm and commit steps happen quite quickly. This timing diagram stresses that the most time consuming operations in the consensus algorithm are sending transactions and validating. We have now covered how the optimistic path works in XX consensus. So all that's left is to analyze what happens when there is disruption in the network. When the optimistic path fails to achieve agreement, XX consensus relies on efficient fallback mechanisms in order to make progress. This is very important as we don't want consensus to halt. 
The fallback is a leader cell algorithm that relies on a second separate inertia sample. This second sample can only decide on the empty block. This is a different type of block which we haven't described yet. It contains no data, so it doesn't change the state of the ledger. No transactions were processed in that route. It is deterministic, which means that every node in the network knows what the empty block is supposed to be on every round. A very important feature of the empty block is that it allows us to keep the randomness chain that Will has described before going forward. This is why we want an empty block. Since we have two separate samples that can only endorse a single binary outcome, so one sample endorses the block proposal and another endorses an empty block, we say that XX consensus is bistable. Now we need to see how the fallback endorsers are selected. This is the same diagram as Will has explained before, with the addition that based on each block random, we select the fallback endorsers for the next round instead of the current round. This is needed, for example, if the BP is offline and doesn't reveal its random value. This is the situation described in round one. In this situation, we don't know who the regular endorsers would have been because the BP has not shared this random value. The fallback endorsers will then decide on the empty block for this round, which contains a fresh random value. It's simply the hash of the node count's random seed in our example. Now for round two, we can see that the fallback endorsers are also selected, but in this case, BP2 is online and he reveals his random, meaning that consensus will operate normally with the endorsers for round two. The fallback endorsers simply stay dormant. We now analyze some of the cases where the fallback is needed. First, if a BP is offline or creates an invalid block, the fallback endorsers are needed in order to decide on an empty block, keeping the randomness chain going, as we have just described before. Another situation is if there are too many Byzantine endorsers and they simply refuse to endorse the block proposal. In this scenario, a current of endorsements will not be reached, so the fallback endorsers will activate and decide on the empty block. A final situation is if an adversary actively attacks the network by creating a partition. In this case, nodes can actually follow separate paths. Some of them might be thinking that the BP is offline and they want to commit an empty block. Others have actually seen a block proposal. But there is no problem. Once the partition ends, the fallback mechanism ensures that excess consensus can recover and will reach the agreement on the BP's proposal. Now we have a little overview of the whole consensus protocol as was explained. Here we have a normal scenario, the optimistic scenario, where the BP is online and he creates a block proposal, sends it to the network. His random reveal will select the endorsers here represented in Mint. Since the network is operating optimistically, this block will probably be accepted if it's valid and everything is working properly. We still have the fallback endorsers here. They have been selected, but they just simply stay dormant because they have seen the block proposal, so they know that the network is trying to reach consensus on it, and there's no need for an empty block. However, if the BP is actually offline, there is no block proposal, so no one in the network actually knows who the endorsers are. This is when the fallback endorsers appear, and they will try to commit an empty block in order to keep the randomness chain going. So now we conclude access consensus showing the properties that we've achieved. First, we have achieved constant transaction communication complexity. This is because all of the transactions which are very large are only sent from the BP to the endorsers and never to the whole network. This obviously allows us to scale very well. Furthermore, we have linear authenticator complexity. This means that in order to achieve agreement, nodes in the network only need to send or receive a linear amount of signatures. This means that if the network scales with size, they will send more signatures, but never in a quadratic way. Then our consensus algorithm is egalitarian. This means that no matter the stake that you've put into the system, your power is the same. So your probability of being, becoming a block producer and getting rewarded for that or an endorser is exactly the same. Then we have unmanipulatable randomness. This is what allows us to leverage the endorser sampling approach because if a BP would be able to mine a random value to choose only his friends, he could basically include any transaction that he wanted to and he could create fake money for himself because all his friends are the ones endorsing that block. Now, this doesn't happen because of the way we have built the randomness chain. 
This random chain also provides us with the next property, probabilistically unpredictable scheduling. So in theory, when the BP is malicious, he has an option to decide on revealing his random or not. If he doesn't reveal his random, he knows that the empty block will be produced. So he knows the next random value and he can try and predict one round in advance who the endorser might be. However, this will only work if he, can, if he knows that the next BP is also his friend and malicious. If he's not, a non BP appearing will have a secret random value that will completely change the randomness in a way that is not predictable. So the probability that you can predict scheduling ahead of time is very, very small. Finally, we also have compact quantum secure proof of finality. This is very important for mobile clients and we use our novel group scheme that Mario has described. With this, we have concluded the XX consensus part of the webinar, and I will now hand over to Ben, which is going to explain XX communication. Hi, this is Ben Wenger from Elixir. So, you know, as a companion to the uh, XX consensus mechanism developed by Praxis, uh, Elixir, we've developed the uh, CMIX uh, a private communication layer. So if we see on the next slide, it's based off of mixing, which our founder and CEO first proposed in 1979 and uh, with an academic paper in 1981. So the basic idea of mixing is that you forward a batch of messages, in this case you see here three, from server to server and each one reorders the messages and then uh, as an in initial proposal decrypts, but uh, uh, but in our system encrypts the batch. So this operation has a fundamental problem in that all of the messages in this batch need to be operated on before it can be passed the next. So when you use public key operations to do these decryption operations and you try to scale the batch size up to increase anonymity, the latencies for processing become incredibly slow. And this has been a problem uh, for mixing for a while and as a result, uh, other less private schemes were developed, including onion routing and uh, a few others. Um, so in uh, 2016, as we can see on the next slide, uh, David uh, published a new protocol called CMIX, which is based off of his original mixing proposal, but with a significant breakthrough in which the network pre-computes 99% of operations in advance. And what this does is it makes it so that the network itself still has to do a bunch of heavy lifting, but the users of the network, you know, the clients who send messages, don't experience the latency associated uh, with this large computational heft. Um, along with this, CMIX uh, thwarts the two main uh, uh, attacks on most anonymity systems, which are packet lengths, in that it utilizes a uniform packet size, and packet timing, uh, in which because it's dealing with batches instead of individual packets, they're delivered simultaneously. So it becomes a lot harder to do statistical timing attacks on the network. And of course, the Elixir CMIX implementation integrates and relies on end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, we use uh, a system based off of in industry standard uh, primitives, which has been updated uh, and modified to best tailor to, uh, to CMIX's implementation. So as we can see here, on the next slide, we've got the basic, uh, the basic fundamental primitives used in the CMIX uh, protocol. And these are modular multiplication and modular exponentiation. So modular multiplication is actually the core encryption primitive. Uh, and this is pretty important because modular multiplication is commutative. So as you can see on the bottom, A times B is equal to B times A, which is different than most encryption schemes where you know, the order of encryption changes the encryption output and you can't encrypt and decrypt in random orders. And this community of property, as you're going to see, is going to be critical in uh, uh, to ensure that operations can, can be done effectively. And the second uh, primary uh, operator that we use is module exponentiation. And this is used exclusively in the pre-computation operation. And it, in it, uh, it is what's used to secure that operation and takes up most of the computational uh, time. And we'll get into that uh, further down. So as you can see on this next slide, the, um, uh, when mixing, 
the nodes don't just reorder stuff, they multiply in keys. So here you can see that M1 goes through and is multiplied with key A1, then key B3, and then key C3. Um, but of course, the permutations here and the keys themselves are, are hidden. So it's not really possible to tell what key was multiplied in, but at the end, you've got all these extra keys kind of attached to messages and you can't really read them or do anything with them. And this is actually where pre-computation comes in because the network does this operation twice. The first time passing in a, uh, a null input, which multiplication is one or unity input and uh, enabling it to at the end divide out these keys. But of course, modular multiplic multiplicative keys, you can't use more than once. You know, you can divide things out and figure out what the keys were or what the underlying message is. And this is where, um, uh, if we see on the next slide, the network um, uh, utilizes something called partially homomorphic encryption, which is a long term. But what it basically means is it allows us to safely use these keys one time in the pre computation and then one time in the real time without taking any risks that through quotients or other mechanisms they can be found out. So essentially, the pre computation is an event where a team, which is a group of nodes executing mixing, builds a template by which once they have real messages, they're going to process uh, those messages. And uh, I'm going to go into a little more detail, but the core mathematical details on here are fairly complex. And we have gone over them in the CMIX academic paper. And also, uh, we have a Discord, which if you, uh, many of us, uh, including myself, are on there regularly. And if you, have, if you have questions about their implementation, can be covered there. Uh, but essentially, as we can see in the next slide, pre-computation allows the network to delay um, or to, to pre-compute pre do the majority of computation before messages are received. And this results in very low latency. Um, you know, it's what allows uh, mixing to be used in a consumer friendly or, or, general, or general use format where previously it, we weren't, it wasn't able to be used. So on the next slide, we have to ask, okay, what am I, we really talking about here? Because what I proposed passed in an unencrypted message and then the output was an unencrypted message. And that's of course not how the network works. Um, the network is actually two pass with an operation at the end. The first pass a user encrypts a payload with multiplicative keys for all the nodes in the team. And as it passes through, the nodes strip off uh, the encryption for them and add on more encryption, which they previously committed to in the pre-computation. As it goes through the second time, more encryption is added as the messages are uh, permuted. So during that first reception phase, the rece recipient is known, but the, um, uh, uh, and then by the time you start doing permutations, the, uh, the recipient is obfuscated. Sorry, the sender is obfuscated. And then on delivery, using the, uh, the combined keys created in pre-computation, the messages are decrypted, revealing the message payload and recipient information, and then they're delivered. Now, this sounds odd, and there's a layer of end-to-end -end encryption, which I'm going to go over uh, uh, at the end of this section which explains exactly how this is done securely. But uh, if we look, but there's another question here, which is, okay, you've got this real time, you've got this pre-computation, how does this apply to a network as a whole? And the next slide uh, we can see about how the network scales using teams. So the way that the network fundamentally operates is that through the same random that Praxis uses to select its own um, uh, block producers and endorsers, a, uh, teams are formed, which actually do this operation. So, a, so ephemerally, a small group of nodes with probably eight, uh, five to eight are selected. They do the pre-computation when they're ready. They then become open to receive message and process messages in real time. So what ends up happening is we can see on the next slide, you've got many of these teams pre-computing at a time with only a single one um, uh, executing real time. And this diagram we have to the right is a simplified description and I'm going to describe this and then back out to what actually is going on. So you can see in the top one, if we imagine that teams stay together, they're not ephemeral, you have a, we've got a purple team which does its pre-computation that's real time. And then three teams later, it's scheduled again. So it has the amount of time it takes for three teams to do a real time in order for it to do its pre-computation to prepare for another real time. 
And the same thing occurs uh, when you have uh, uh, met, um, many more teams, except because they're going more frequently, the amount of time the purple team has to pre-compute is quite longer. So pre-compute or pre-computation, that is more than twice the, um, uh, the size of, the, uh, of it could when there's only four teams. And fundamentally what this does is this, uh, the larger the pre-computation, the more messages the team can process in real time. Now, as the number of messages increase, so does the time uh, of real time, but the amount that increases by is relatively small. So as a result, these, um, uh, these payloads are, it, it scales quite widely before you hit the, the scaling ceiling of this. And the current expectation is that somewhere between 100,000 to a million messages per second and then a million, 100,000 to a million messages in a batch, uh, in a batch itself is where the network uh, hits the wall of this form of scaling. Of course, there's another one where you can actually be running teams in parallel because unlike a blockchain, mixing doesn't require complete agreement or some form of agreement in the network. It's just simply a delivery. So on the next slide, uh, we talk a little bit about end-to-end -end encryption, which is we use an end-to-end -end encryption scheme. Uh, it's based off of the same, uh, same general structure, so double ratcheting that uh, most modern end-to-end encryption uh, systems use. Uh, with the fundamental difference that along with the end-to-end -end encryption, we don't have a, the identity of the sender. Instead, we have a fingerprint, which only the sender and recipient can use to identify the key used to encrypt and the sender, which means that when the message is fully decrypted by the network, you still have the end-to-end -end encrypted payload and this fingerprint, which is only useful to the recipient. We also have a Mac, which the recipient can use to check the validity of the message, which is fairly standard. Um, so I think that we're now gonna get into the general questions about the end, -end uh, about the XX network as a whole and how these two structures integrate. Oh, I'm sorry, forgot about the return path. So the return path is a process by which the team actually doesn't disband once it delivers. It waits for a bit and actually does a reverse batch using the same permutation but different keys. Um, in order to deliver messages from the recipient back to the sender. And this process is used by uh, Praxis, uh, which they, I think uh, they'll discuss um, uh, in a later date. It's actually used by, will be used by the user discovery protocol once it's completed, whose initial version is currently running with the XX Messenger, which uh, I, hopefully many of you have tested. Um, so, but these return paths also can be used for anonymous communication because if the sender doesn't reveal their identity with the message that they sent, the receiver can still respond back, albeit fairly quickly. So in the next slide, uh, we're gonna go back, uh, we're gonna talk about the integration of uh, these two components and the structure of the XX network as a whole. Um, so I think I'm gonna uh, hand off to Jake to talk a little bit about gateways. Hey there, thanks Ben. Um, so one of the sort of miscellaneous uh, topics that we wanted to cover that warrants men mentioning is why uh, nodes uh, require two servers to operate. And the reason for that is the existence of gateways, which are essentially serving as the entry points into the network and they're paired with each uh, node that's operating. And these namely uh, don't really possess any critical information, private keys, anything extraordinarily important, but they serve as sort of a protective layer that insulates the nodes uh, from the outside world. And that way uh, they can do things like filter incoming communications in the event of DDoS attacks, but at the same time they also serve uh, important functionality in that they, they can store messages sent through the system, so that way even if you aren't signing in with a client every single day, uh, you'll still be able to get messages as they're stored there, um, which I think at the moment is for about 30 days, your messages are uh, stored encrypted here on the gateways so they can be fetched uh, the next time that you sign in. And uh, overall, this is just sort of uh, a logical separation between the duties of nodes as operators of CMIX uh, and gateways which sort of interface with the messaging side of the platform. And uh, I think we're gonna move on to mixing, which, uh, take it away. Uh, so 
we're now back here at the general overview uh, slide and we've reviewed these components. Um, so these things have some more interactions, which we're going to cover now. There aren't too many slides less for the Q&A. So I think we'll hand over to uh, Will. All right. Thanks, Ben. All right. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, Elixir and Praxis work together uh, to achieve some pretty cool things. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, mixed team scheduling. And so in the previous segment, Ben mentioned that mixed teams are unmanipulatable. And this is actually quite important because uh, this is how we preserve the privacy of the mixing. Generally, it is a significant challenge to create unmanipulatable randomness in a decentralized network. But luckily, if you didn't fall asleep while I discussed the committed randomness section, uh, we can actually use that same randomness uh, to schedule BPs and endorsers to schedule the mixed teams. So there is a key difference in, in how we do the scheduling uh, compared to the endorsers and the BPs. And that is because it relies on an approach that we call geographic binning. And a geographic bin is simply a grouping of all the nodes that are located in a broad discrete geographical area. So for example, like all the nodes in Western Europe might be in the same geographic bin. Um, and, and this is important because when we schedule nodes for a mixed team, we ensure that each node in the team is actually located in a different geographic bin. And this does two things. First, it optimizes the network latency for communications between all team members. And secondly, and most importantly, it ensures that nodes are located across many different jurisdictions, making it difficult to force the nodes to break privacy. Now, speaking of privacy, next we're gonna look at how we leverage Elixir's mixing to provide privacy and payments. So here's a quick diagram kind of illustrating this point. Um, in the center, we see a simple mix network comprised of three nodes, and they are processing a batch where at least two people are sending payments along with a number of messages from other users. And we'll go into the importance of the messages uh, in a moment, but first we're gonna focus on the payments. So purple and blue are sending payments of different total values, where purple is sending three XX and blue is sending six XX. However, these transactions are split up into denominated subtransactions that are uniform within their denomination. So twos and twos uh, will generally look very, very similar and be indistinguishable and fungible. When these coins are sent through the mix batch with messages, it becomes impossible for the nodes and anyone monitoring the network to differentiate which of the packets are coin transactions and which are regular transactions, or I'm sorry, which are regular messages. All they see in this case is six indistinguishably encrypted messages. And when that batch is mixed and the packets are partially decrypted, uh, revealing who the recipients are, uh, the network sorts the messages from the payments and it delivers those payments to the block producer, which we show up here. Uh, in this case, these are coins. And those, those coins are processed in consensus and transferred to the new owners. Uh, but because these coins were mixed uh, with coins, many of which were the same denomination, but also messages uh, from thousands of users, it's probabilistically impossible for someone to distinguish which coin came from which person. And uh, furthermore, without knowing which coins came from which person, it becomes impossible to figure out the total value of the payment that a single person sent. And so the messages in this case become particularly important to our privacy claims um, because they give us a much larger anonymity set than a payments only platform might have. So in a payments only platform, you'd obviously be processing many uh, fewer transactions a second than if you also included instant messaging. And so you'll have many less pet, uh, packets available with which to mix your payments, um, which means reverse engineering those packets becomes much easier to accomplish. So by including these thousands of messages intermixed with the payments, uh, we can supply massive anonymity sets uh, to our network. And so let's look at another way in which mixing consensus work together. Uh, and you'll hear about transaction ordering a lot in the blockchain space and the mix protocol we use actually allows us to do a unique uh, operation in this regard. Uh, Elixir's technology outputs a batch of transactions and these are cryptographically guaranteed to have a particular order. 
And honestly, this is a very ideal input for a blockchain as it removes the ability of a, say, block producer to manipulate the ordering of transactions and because blocks are simil similarly processed in batches. And so now you have this um, pre-ordered batch of transactions that's um, already ready for the block producer uh, to process and propose. So this unique property helps us streamline consensus um, and offers unmanipulatively ordered transactions while providing privacy. And finally, Elixir technology provides a privacy feature that is unique to our platform. One important feature of blockchain is the ability to publicly verify that consensus was completed and that a transaction reached finality. Unfortunately, if you go ahead and ask a node for a block or even a block explorer for proof that a specific transaction is final, you've probably just revealed that you are likely the owner or somehow related to the owner of that transaction. Uh, this return path that Ben mentioned in the communication section uh, actually allows us to leverage the privacy offered by mixing to privately return a partial Merkle proof to the sender of the transaction um, without anyone knowing that it's being sent to them. So using this and a proof of finality of any block in the future, the user can verify that the transaction was successful, reached finality, um, and they can do this without asking any of the nodes in the network or any other server for additional information on the transaction. And so as you can see using these approaches, we've really tried to integrate Elixir's mix technology and Praxis's blockchain technology uh, so that they're mutually beneficial. Uh, and, and, and to anchor this point home, I'm gonna hand it off to Ben, who's gonna finish off by discussing how these technologies uh, share node resources. Uh, hi, this is Ben again. So, you know, one significant question here is how the same nodes operate both of these uh, uh, separate systems. And here's a graph here which shows roughly the uh, resource utilization uh, for uh, Elixir Signage Protocol. And again, the relationship between real time pre computation here is not to scale. But um, it's a, so what you see is that on the network side, Elixir, you requires good bandwidth, but doesn't use it consistently. It uses it for short periods of time to transfer batches and then uh, remains dormant. Uh, which, uh, and on the CPU side, it only really becomes CPU intensive during the real time. Its pre-computations, which are ongoing for long periods of time, are heavy on GPU utilization. In fact, that's where the majority of the computation takes place, but uh, that isn't uh, particularly used. Uh, it, that's the bulk of its resource uh, utilization. As we can see on the next slide, the, uh, when we look at practices utilization, it's quite complementary. Other than during the real time where, uh, due to the CPU utilization, the node uh, um, doesn't participate in block production or endorsement, it is able to do both operations simultaneously and participate in both parts of the network. Um, you know, this is pretty important. If you can only do one or the other, it would heavily reduce the uh, utility of combining the two into the same network. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, I'm going to pass it off to Jake, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, how the nodes are in the AlphaNet currently are managed and how we hope to take these uh, processes and build them into the beta net and into the mainnet. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so yeah, with all this incredible technology that we're working on, uh, obviously it's very different to, to theorize versus bring something into the real world for people to actually use. And uh, thanks to our node operators, uh, that's exactly what we're hoping to do. And to support our node operators sort of in this process, we're trying to deliver two options uh, for nodes for how they would like to sort of deploy and manage their nodes. And the first of these is a Amazon Web Services cloud deployment. And this is essentially the turnkey solution. Uh, there's no real configuration or technical experience required. It simply requires a configured uh, AWS account and uh, the activation of our sort of deployment package. And in less than an hour, this process can be um, completed start to finish and a node can be part of the network in as short a time as that. Uh, this, this process sort of relies on an open source tool uh, called Terraform. And that's sort of a way of showing infrastructure as code. And that's going to allow people to, to sort of see exactly what they're getting into 
in terms of what infrastructure is going to do, be deployed and also sort of see uh, the cost associated with that through uh, AWS as well. And this sort of comes with the caveat that more cloud providers, uh, support for more cloud providers is yet to come, such as uh, Azure and Google Cloud, uh, to sort of broaden the options even further in terms of a real easy solution to deploying nodes. And for, for those with a much stronger degree of technical expertise, uh, servers can also be you know, built uh, and maintained in-house uh, by servers that any node operator controls directly. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this involves the actual node itself and the accompanying gateway server, which is uh, paired very strongly with nodes throughout the system. And they're essentially considered uh, sort of a single entity in the context of the system. Uh, this process is a bit longer uh, as a trade-off for the finer grain of control. Um, but also has an accompanying setup guide uh, that is relatively straightforward to follow, doesn't require extraordinarily advanced knowledge, and beginning to end uh, with the proper hardware can be completed easily in four hours. So it's a very, very strong and straightforward process to uh, getting nodes out into the real world. And next slide, please. In the Alphanet, uh, we actually have a mix of both of these options uh, running at the moment. Alphanet is currently utilizing five nodes, which you can actually uh, look at on our status page and see where they are and how they're operating uh, and their transactional speed. Um, of these five nodes, uh, three, excuse me, of these five nodes were deployed using AWS. And then we also have three backup nodes uh, as well for a total of eight nodes. So of this total, five were deployed using AWS and three are what we call bare metal, basically in-house managed servers. And these servers currently span across three content, continents with, the, with backup servers also residing in South America. And neither, since, uh, since Alphanet first began running um, a few months back, there hasn't been a single instance of uh, necessitating the use of the backup nodes or any manual intervention whatsoever uh, from the node operators. So um, at the moment, it's very much a uh, sort of deploy, configure, and forget situation of node operation. Uh, it's an extraordinarily stable system for being this early in sort of the, uh, the, the roadmap. And we're all really excited to uh, sort of watch as the system grows into beta net and on the main net. Great, thank you, Jake. Uh, this is Peter again, and at this point, uh, Thanks to those of you who are joining us live, uh, and we're going to be eager to turn to your questions. 